There's one more thing we need to do with the Fourier series representation. Um, and um, this, is the, this is the part that trips up a lot of people. And um, as we're going through the notation, I want you to always have in your, in your mind when we talk about Fourier representations and Fourier transforms and Fourier series, all we are saying is that we are representing a signal, eventually an image, in terms of a cosine and a sine basis. That's it. Everything else is the notation. We got to understand the notation, don't get me wrong, but hold that in your head as we're going through all these notational um, uh, um, issues here. So let me remind you where we were last time. We said that if we have a periodic signal, um, f of x, um, we can write it as a sum of scale, a sub k and b sub k, uh, cosines and sines, each of zero phase. Okay, so, and, and obviously um, um, increasing frequencies from low frequency to high frequency. That's the Fourier series. It makes a statement about the representation, but it doesn't tell you how to represent it. It doesn't tell you what a sub k and b sub k, it just says you can do this. And the Fourier transform tells you how. How do you represent it? And because again, this basis representation is orthonormal, the uh, representations a sub k and b sub k are simply computed as a dot product between the signal and the underlying basis vector. Okay? And that's the Fourier transform. And really, we could have stopped here. Um, this could have been it. And then we would have gone to 2D, and I would have shown you the relationship to linear time invariant systems, convolution, and we would have used this Fourier transform. But there's something a little frustrating about this basis representation, which is I have to lug around two terms everywhere. Right? And we don't do that with, say, base 10. It's not like I have base 10 and base something else that I have to lug around. The number is represented with respect to a single base. But here I've got these two terms I'm lugging around. And notationally, that's a little cumbersome. And so what you will see in the literature, and the reason why I'm going to do it here is you will see this everywhere, is there is a mechanism to combine these two bases into a single basis using the so-called complex exponential. And I will be the first person to admit that this trips people up quite a bit. But in the same way that I ask you, whenever you hear Fourier series and Fourier transforms, think I'm representing something in terms of sines and cosines. Um, when I say that the, expo the complex exponential, which is e to the uh, i omega x, think we're just bundling up cosines and sines. It's just a notational convenience. So what is the complex exponential? Um, arguably one of the most beautiful uh, equations in mathematics. E to the power i omega x, where i is the complex uh, value i, square root of negative 1, is equal to cos omega x plus i sine omega x. We could try to prove this. It's not really that important. If you're interested in that, you should go look it up. But this is a, a well-known uh, relationship between two, by the way, seemingly very different things. All right, um, e to the power i omega x and then the, the sum of the, the cosines and the sines. But notice what it does. It bundles up the two things that we care about, the cosine and the sine function. And that was sort of the goal of this, is to stop having to lug around two things up here in the Fourier series and the Fourier transforms and put them into a single thing, and that's where the complex exponential comes from. So let's see what that's going to look like. So now what we're going to do is we're going to write the four, that we're going to write our signal in terms of the complex exponential. So my signal f of x is equal to 1 over m, the sum from k equals 0 to m minus 1, same thing, uh, scale factor, c sub k, and then e to the i omega k x, which of course is just that thing right there. And again, c sub k, the scale factor on this complex exponential basis, is simply a dot product between the signal and the same basis, but we need a negative sign right there. And I'm not going to derive all of this because it's quite cumbersome notationally. And it's, it turns out when you do this derivation, however, that c sub k is just combines the a sub k and the b sub k, which are what? The cosine and the sine terms into a single complex value. And that is quite elegant because now what we've done is we have our signal in terms of the complex exponential. We have our weights, the actual underlying representation of that basis in terms of a complex value. And we've done exactly what we wanted to do. We've bundled everything up into a single basis representation in terms of the complex exponential. Now, this thing right here, C sub k, which are the weights associated with the basis, and that's, of course, what's interesting to us. In the same way that the weights on the canonical basis tell us what the value of the signal is, the weights 
on each of those cosine terms and sine terms of different frequencies tell us something about the underlying representation, which we'll be seeing in a little bit. Since this is a complex valued um, quantity, um, we can think about it in a couple of ways. We can think about it in terms of the real and the imaginary. That would tell us what the cosine and the sine term is. Um, more often, we are going to represent this in terms of magnitude and phase. So think of that C sub K as a vector in a complex plane. You've got the real axis on the horizontal axis. You have the imaginary axis on the vertical axis. And each C sub K is just some vector in that space. Yeah, it's a complex uh, space. So that vector has, has a phase, an orientation relative to the, uh, the horizontal axis, and it has a magnitude. How long is it? And the magnitude, of course, is just the sum of the squares of the components. And the phase, of course, is just the arctan of the B sub K over the A sub K. And this representation is going to turn out to be particularly useful in computer vision and image processing and image analysis, because more often than not, we are interested in how much regardless of the phase of each harmonic is there. Is there a lot of high frequency? Is there a lot of low frequency? Is there a particular band frequency that corresponds to something that I care about? And so we'll typically be talking about the magnitude of the Fourier transform, and occasionally we will talk about the phase as well. I will admit that's a lot of notation, um, and you need to go back and make sure you understand that, but here's the, here's the, the, the really, I'm gonna emphasize this over and over again. When we talk about Fourier series, when we talk about Fourier transforms, all we are talking about is a change of bases. It's the same as going from base 10 to base 2, and with that comes certain conveniences and certain inconveniences. This basis representa representation tells us how much a signal, eventually an image, is composed of, of cosines and sines of varying frequency. And that's very powerful when you are trying to analyze images and audio signals for certain patterns, particularly periodic patterns, because that's what the underlying basis is. So um, that's the, the big level idea. Now, there's all the mathematical notation. So if the complex exponential is confusing, it's OK. Um, we're going to see it over and over again. It's going to become easier and easier. But again, when you hear complex exponential, think bundling together sines and cosines. When you hear bundling sines and cosines together, think this is just a change of bases. And in fact, it's an orthonormal basis, so it's a particularly easy change of basis.